We have a great presenter here today that's going to talk a little bit about the future of careers and where things are going and how technology potentially is going to influence how you're going to be able to get your positions and I'm sure he's going to have some more information as well. So if we could give him a nice round of applause, please. Thank you very much. Without further ado, we have Paul Reiner. Thank you. Yeah. Awesome, man. Yeah. I really appreciate it. Thank you. I'm excited to actually be in front of you guys. I've been hoping to get in front of a, uh, a college audience for a while. I've been presenting to different business groups and uh, I think actually you're the audience that this is most meaningful for. So today we're going to look at what is being called the exponential age, which means uh, an era that humankind hasn't experienced yet. An exponential in that it's going to bring us a rate of change that's much greater than any rate of change we've ever seen in, in the history of humankind. And, and this is important actually. So the human brain actually isn't really designed to understand an exponential era. We have a really good mechanisms for recognizing patterns, right? And when we think about like the last, let's say, 10 years, and imagine how much progress has that been? Let's see, oh, okay, it's about this much. I look at the development of the internet, things that have happened on cell phones, medicine, travel, other things like that. Oh, I wonder what that would look like going forward 10 more years ago. Hmm, that'd kind of be interesting, right? The reality is it's nothing like that. An exponential shift brings changes that cannot be imagined by looking, past, looking back at the past 10 years. If you're standing here, and the future is right in front of you, you actually don't have any way to see this because you haven't been there yet. You like the quality of my graphs? This is some high quality graphs. <laughs> you can look back and make sort of guesses about what, what's going to happen going forward. You can make guesses by looking at the past, but as you do that, what you're doing if you imagine the last 15 years and say, all right, let's take the last 15 years and go forward. Wow, look at what that's going to be like. Imagine, imagine what life's going to be like here. Well, it's not going to get you there, right? So what if you say just the last five years? Because things have definitely accelerated in their development in the last five years, right? You're looking at self-driving cars. You're looking at artificial intelligence, machine learning. Uh, when uh, in 2008, I think, uh, uh, IBM's computer beat Kasparov, the world grand champion of chess, that was a big deal. And then we had Blue, uh, which beat the, uh, the Jeopardy champion, Jeopardy world champion. And then more recently, we've, we've designed a computer that was capable of defeating the human at Go, which is the Chinese version of chess. It is infinitely more complicated. The possibilities in Go exceed the number of particles in the universe. And yet, we've now built computers more capable than humans to actually strategically plan out and win at that game. But that's just the last five years. So, so we, well, if, what if I took the last five years and imagine that going forward? It's like, well, that's up here. Well, that's, that's even more interesting. But that won't get you there because you're still, you're still projecting a linear path when you do that. It is not going to be a linear path. It's going to be an exponential one, an exponential curve that goes straight up, right? So you can read. I, I tend to not be a person who reads the slides that I project because you guys can all read. Ray Kurzweil is uh, um, a futurist. He's considered one of the uh, foremost experts on what's to come in the future. And yet in this quote here, you can see that he's admitting that it's very difficult to project what's going to happen in the future, only because we tend to look at the past in order to estimate. So I want to talk a little bit about disruption, winners and losers. Hopefully you recognize most of the names on the right, but I mean, um, some of them haven't been around for a while, but they were massive incumbent institutions that had major income flows, big profit margins, lots of stores, major employee bases. In 2000, Reed Hastings, the founder of a little fledgling company at that time called Netflix, flew to Dallas to propose a partnership to Blockbuster CFO. The idea was that Netflix would run Blockbuster's brand online and the other firm would uh, promote the, you know, the Netflix thing in the, in the Blockbuster store so they could have kind of a symbiotic thing. He was basically laughed out of the room. Blockbuster went bankrupt in 2010, and obviously Netflix is the big winner in that story. Blockbuster had its peak in 2004. Uh, Blockbuster had nearly 60,000 employees in over 8,000 stores with a $5 billion value. 2010, they're bankrupt. That's a major change, a major shift in a very short amount of time, right? Kodak, 1981, Kodak sales surpassed $10 billion annual sales. That's pretty impressive, but then again, in 2012, Kodak was bankrupt. That's a business that was huge in this car. Tower Records, 1998, 200 stores and a billion dollars in annual sales. 98, 
to 2006, they went bankrupt. That's fast. Mm -hmm. Uber, $5.5 billion net revenue in 2016. They had a $62 billion valuation. That was now, that's now two years ago. Airbnb with $12 billion in bookings in 2016 has the largest hotel inventory, quote, hotel inventory in the world, yet owns no hotels. That didn't take long, right? From when they got started to becoming the largest owner of hotel inventory. All right. The areas of focus we're going to be looking at today, you can see them here. This is not all of the technologies that are going to be involved in the exponential age, just some of them. But they are, in my opinion, some of the most interesting, and they will be some of the most impactful. The reason it's important to kind of get an understanding of how these technologies are going to change the landscape of business, of careers, right, is because of where you guys are heading. I think it's important for you to have this information so that when you're making choices about the kind of careers that you want to get into or what your life is even going to look like, you can make choices going forward. Okay. <laughs> The other thing is that a lot of the technologies that I'm going to show you, it is early days, right? And there was an early day for the cell phone. This, this gentleman right here, this is actually one of, the, uh, one of the inventors of the cell phone. This is Barton Cooper, this is uh, a senior developer at Motorola. He looks pretty stoked. But if anyone of us was holding that phone today, none of, none of us would be very excited. Wouldn't want to be seen around campus probably rocking that sucker, taking your phone calls. But obviously the future brings us new things, right? This is a concept from Samsung for a, uh, a cell phone that basically is the shape of a pen with a flexible screen that pulls out. We're aiming to have this on the shelves in the next 18 months. That's different, right? Of course, you won't see it here. You'll see it in Japan first. Um, of course. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Here's another important picture to help you understand the speed at which technology adoption can take place. And I'm going to base this brief story over 100 years ago. This is a picture from downtown New York, 1904. Do you see any cars? No. Maybe a couple, but mostly that's horse-drawn carriages, right? 1904. Let's take a look at 1912. Do you see any horses? That didn't take long, did it? And that was 100 years ago. The pathways for distribution and adoption of technology today dwarfs what was possible here, and yet look how fast that happened. It's important to realize how quickly things can change. The Model T was brought on the market in 1908. And the, just from that point in time, the first time when cars surpassed horses in the US was 1917. Obviously, that happened a lot faster in New York. OK, so the first one is self-driving cars. What are they? You can, this information on the side, like I said, I don't like to read the stuff in my slides. But what's important about the information here is that it reflects the scope of investment and intensity of focus that some of the largest businesses in the world are paying to the development of this technology. And there's a reason why I'll show you what that reason is. Every one of the major manufacturers of automobile has promised delivery of an autonomous vehicle, every one of them by 2021, with Tesla delivering their first one this year for the public market. What are they? So you've got roof-mounted LiDAR systems that can detect the presence of objects and where things are moving in, uh, in the environment that the car is operating in. 1.4 million laser point uh, senses per second. They've got 3D mapping, 20 onboard cameras, rooftop GPS. You can see a multitude of antennas, those black antennas protruding from the top. Those are all GPS antennas, much more intense than the GPS you'd have on your phone or, or in your car right now. What is this going to look like from a car ownership standpoint? You will not own a car. Why would you own a car in a situation? Why would you not own a car? The reason is because you will subscribe to a car service. And if you want a sedan on a Tuesday, a convertible on a Wednesday, a minivan on a Thursday, a pickup truck on a Friday, uh, and a station wagon on Saturday, you'll have access to all those cars. And they will come to you. And because you're only paying for them when you use them, ultimately you'll be paying one quarter to one fifth as much as you pay right now to own a car. You will not be responsible for cleaning it, for maintaining it, for changing the tires, for insuring it, for registering it. All those responsibilities go away. The car shows up when you need it, it goes away when you don't. 
that takes you to your destination and drops you off. Or you, if you want to be driving, you can choose to be driving, that's fine. But I believe there will come a time when manual driving will become outlawed. 40,000 people a year die in the United States from automobile accidents. The number one growing cause, distracted driving. Self-driving cars do not get distracted. They don't get tired, they don't get drunk, they don't get angry. <laughs> right? All these things that we expect is happening with cars that are being driven by regular people. You won't need to park it. You won't need a driveway, you won't need a garage. Remember Airbnb, I mentioned that a minute ago? What do you think people are gonna do with their garages? That'd be a cool plan, right? Use your garage for Airbnb? That's mm -hmm. cool. A little side cash right there, right? That's right. Parking structures in downtown areas, all this parking that you see out here, I don't need to have my car sit out there because the car that I got here in is gonna go and be useful somewhere else while I'm here. And maybe the same car comes to pick me up, maybe it doesn't. Well, you want your same car, you can make that choice, but if you have an option to have any vehicle that you want, any, any day that you want, any time that you want for one fifth as much, it seems to me that that's a pretty obvious choice. The car will also be completely reimagined. This is a subtle reimagining of cars, right? sort of facing the other way when you're going down the road, yeah? More significant, reimagining. Still subtle. I like the one where the, the driver's seat lays back like a first class flight, that's <laughs> nice. <laughs> but even more significant redesigns, right? You'll have, you'll have theater cars, you'll have meeting cars, you'll have perhaps even workout cars. Because you don't need to be operating it, you'll have cars that are supercars, little suites that you can get down to Phoenix, Arizona if you want to overnight and have a nice little rest, right? With meals waiting for you. There's very interesting kinds of things. The car will be so different. Trucks too, not just cars. These trucks are capable of operating within 18 inches of each other in total blackout situations. They don't need lights. The roads that they need can be totally independent for the roads that the other cars are on. And because they can travel within 18 inches of each other, they have major fuel saving opportunities. I don't wanna see the, the, like the nerve rattling that you'd have to get into to operate a truck as a human that close to another truck. That wouldn't go well for me. I don't think it would go well for most people. <laughs> right. So these are real now, right? Self-driving taxis. Uh, Voyage, Udacity, Waymo, all, all these companies have self-driving taxis in operation today. This is real and it is now. Domino is delivering with self-driving. Yes, it's actually happening. <laughs> There's a, the, right, so you've got this idea of like a movie car, like facing back and watching your movie. And your car's gonna get you there. This is interesting for me, I, my son, uh, he's 13 now, that means he's three years away. And like I said, every major manufacturer has promised delivery of cars by 2021. Do I want a teenager driving himself, or do I want the car that's taking 1.4 million readings per second on its environment driving him? It'll be interesting to make that choice at that time. Right, so what changes? What's impacted with self-driving cars? We talked about the ownership model. We talked about garage and roadway. Safety, obviously, a big deal. Business leisure travel, uptime hotels, all these things change, right? Do you need people who uh, run parking meters? No. What about highway patrol? People at fuel stations, people at maintenance stations, people who sell tires? No, not a one of them. You don't need these positions because car maintenance will be centralized, right? Uber will offer you a subscription, the car comes to you and then it goes away. It gets fuel, it gets oiled, it gets maintained, it gets cleaned all within the central location. It doesn't mean there's still work there, but not nearly as much as there was, right? Rest stops, the, the, the secondary and tertiary businesses that sit around these systems, like the, the uh, automotive transportation system, including insurance, etc., all undergo a major shift. It's important to think about how these are going to change industries going forward, right? Paying attention to the trajectory of these solutions and how they can impact careers that you might be looking at is very valuable. Let's talk about VR and AR. Or not, you don't want to talk about that? <laughs> Anybody see Ready Player One? <coughs> and full of folks in the room, okay. Virtual reality, having yourself fully immersed in a reality that is not the one that you're in. 
augmented reality, having elements that don't exist in your space appear to be projected into the space that you're in, right? You're still in reality, but it's augmented somehow. Investments into this space. Almost every electronics company you can imagine, and some of them aren't even electronics companies. Do you see Disney, right? Do you see Comcast? Kind of an electronic, electronic company, but not really. Every one of these businesses investing significantly in the development of these technologies. Why? Well, with virtual reality, if you want to, you can basically teleport yourself to a place that you're not right now. As the quality of virtual reality improves, it's your ability to really distinguish whether you're there or not there will dissolve. And remember I showed you this, the, the cell phone early days, right? That's where we are right now. But it won't take long to get to a place where it's barely or even not at all distinguishable from reality. Travel to places that you're not, right? I think this is a picture of Ireland. Travel to places that aren't real. Maybe subtly not real. Maybe extremely not real. Sorry, that one's a little dark. Shrink yourself down to the size of an ant if you want to and visit environments that a regular human can't. Take yourself back in time. You would need to have this obviously either computer generated or done with actors, but a recreation of the signing of the Declaration of Independence could be an amazing thing to visit. When you learn about the Declaration of Independence by watching a video, by reading a book, you retain it or it, it impacts you in a certain way. If you perceive that you're physically present in that moment in time, the scope of your experience covers so much more than just reading or watching. The impact that it has on you, the way that you remember it, how you integrate the meaning of that moment into your life experience expands in an extraordinary way. Shrink yourself down to the size of an atom and literally witness photosynthesis take place. These are possibilities of virtual reality. Expand yourself to the size of a nebula and watch stars be born. Accelerate time, change your size, anything you can imagine possible here. The impact that this is gonna have on learning is significant. Out of MIT, they've developed a system that allows you, while you're wearing fully immersive virtual reality, to catch a tennis ball in real time as it's tossed to you. Which means that that tennis ball is being tracked in space and its presence in space is being duplicated for you in the virtual reality simulation. So that when you reach your hand out in the right place at the right time, you will catch that ball. That's an interesting idea. In Ready Player One, they wear haptics, haptic suits, haptic gloves. Remember the early days photograph of the cell phone? This is not attractive. But these systems are designed to give you a tactile experience as you reach out and interact with objects, reach out and interact with the environment in a virtual reality so that it, it appears to be real through feeling. The one on, on this side, on the left side, is actually uh, um, essentially operates as a stylus that allows a surgeon to feel the resistance of tissue as they apply a robotic scalpel. So I can feel that tissue responding. Early days. Okay. <laughs> pilot training. Virtual reality pilot training. This is an omnidirectional treadmill. They also had one of these, but a much cooler one, in Ready Player One. This one's real. I saw this one at the Consumer Electronics Show three years ago. Basically wear slippery boots and walk around inside this disc, but it means that you can move yourself inside a virtual reality experience. Otherwise, what you're left with, which most people do now, if they have the Oculus Rift or the Vive, they have hand controllers like a PlayStation type of thing so that they can move their avatar through an environment. This allows you to move through an environment like you move in the real environment. Impacts, of course, right? How do we learn and how do we shop? If you have virtual reality, you can teleport yourself to a retail space and shop there, or you can have these things brought to your own space and see what they look like in front of you or on you or near you. Remote application of specialized skills, we saw surgery, other things like this. Let's talk about augmented reality. Bringing things into your environment that aren't actually there. So you'd have your own space, it'd be like in here, I could have that globe if you all were wearing uh, AR units, 
that globe would appear here. And as you move your head, it wouldn't be that the globe would move around with your head like this. It would appear to be stable inside our 3D space. Right here, that globe right here. And if you look to your left, it would be out of your vision. If you came back, it would stay where it was. It has persistence. That'd be so fun. I love this idea. Right? I want a micro elephant in my hands, please. Right, so we're talking about what we can, the kinds of exper experiences we can create. Minecraft, or videos Minecraft. Right, have Minecraft here on this table or in front of you, and if, if one of you was working on it, we all could see it, right? We could have a shared experience, making books more interesting, making gaming more interesting, making sports more interesting, right? To have the stadium actually in front of you. And in a way that if I was looking at the stadium from this side, and you were on that side, it, it would be appropriate for that view. I would be looking at the same stadium, but from the other side, right? That that thing would appear in your home. Obviously opens up some advertising possibilities, like to imagine the football player blasting through your wall and selling you some Gatorade, right? Uh-huh. Advertising's gonna get a little weird. Here's an example of advertising, maybe not getting weird, but looking at a, a flyer and then Viewing it through your phone, these applications exist now. Viewing it through your phone, Amazon has something like this. Several companies offering solutions like this where you can look at an ad and have a 3D rendering of that object appear on the ad or in your house. These things are here now. But augmented reality has the potential to give us things that are bordering on superpowers. Okay. This is an example of an augmented reality user manual. All right, maybe that's not a superpower, but as I look around in a space, in this case I'm looking at the console of a car, I can know what everything is, right? Just by looking through the lens of my phone or a tablet, really have the information there in front of me. Right now let's get more advanced. This is an industrial machine inside of a factory. I don't know these parts. I don't know anything about this machine, but that knowledge is there. The collective knowledge of mankind is present on the internet. We all have access to it. Imagine using augmented reality to layer it on top of our physical reality. So that I know which button to press, which screw to turn. If I open the hood of my car, and augmented reality, so I wouldn't even have to tell it what my car is. It would know because of the relative positions of the different caps and whatnot. Oh, you want to change your air, fil air filter? Here's what you need to do. There's a company called Worklink that has this technology now. There it is, right there. This is, I mean, it's not quite you know matrix downloading of information, but you're getting close. You have a grocery list that you've been building at home. Take it to the store. Don't walk down the aisles. Walk past the aisles, and it will tell you where you need to go to find the things that are on your list. Looking at outside of the street to have information layered on top of your, of your physical reality that you couldn't possibly know just by walking there, right? Where's the water main? There it is. What's the distance here? 3.1. How many cubic feet in that building? How tall is this, this pillar, this angular pillar? Where's parking? This information can be layered on top of your reality. Spill a box of marbles and instantly know how many are there. Imagine playing billiards with this kind of technology. Here I am looking at uh, a work site, but the program, uh, sorry, the design for what we're going to do with this work site is entered into CAD, computer aided drafting, so that the, the 3D reality of what this thing is gonna look like when it's done is known, so as I walk through the space, I can look at this space as if it's already complete. If I'm the plumber and I wanna make sure that the work I'm doing doesn't interfere with the work that the electrician is gonna do after I leave, I can have that projected on top of the workspace that I'm operating in. So I just know. All the back and forth that you do, go back to the blueprints and maybe getting it right or wrong, that's over. What's interesting, if you think about this, taking augmented reality, if you, if you find that your dryer breaks, Right now you're calling someone. Your car breaks. Right now you're calling someone. Even your TV has a problem. You, maybe you're going to use YouTube, right? That'd be a nice next step. Imagine if anything that could possibly go wrong in your home, something with plumbing, something with electricity, something with an appliance, that the information's there. And right now, if anyone's done like home maintenance or appliance maintenance with YouTube, they know that that information is there. But imagine it being so there that you have an augmented reality headset on and you can look at the problem and know exactly what to do step by step. Is that going to impact service industries? Home professionals? Absolutely it will. 
in a big way. It already has, actually, when you talk to service professionals that are aware of what's happening for YouTube. I fixed my own dryer right on YouTube. Well, by using YouTube, right? Looked it up, saw what was happening. Oh, I see that part, I see this part, here we go. Fix my dryer. I know that the service professional that I ordinarily would have called for that probably isn't stoked that I'm now using YouTube to get that done, but I am, along with millions of other people. And augmented reality is only gonna make that easier. Let's talk about robotics. <laughs> drones, right? We know about drones. Drones flying around with cameras. But apparently drones are also flying around with chairs. <laughs> okay. Drones are flying around with life preservers. Right? Coast Guard. Who can get there faster? If you got somebody 50 yards out having trouble in the waves. Somebody running with the red shorts and the, right? Or this thing. Definitely this thing's getting there faster. Forestry and firefighting. This is not a fire extinguishing drone. This is a fire starting drone. That's the face that I made right there when I first saw that. Mm -hmm. Why would you do that? The reason is because in, in, in firefighting and wild firefighting, creating fire breaks is, is a major sort of strategy, right? So when you have the, the wind going towards where the fire is coming from, you can start your own fire and back burn towards where the, uh, the fire origin is so that you, you create a wide break by using fire. This thing lays down a line of fire uh, in order to do that. Uh, this is an automated drone system for monitoring the, the uh, progress on large-scale large, large work sites like when a building like this is constructed. This drone has a very specific flight path. It takes photographs and video as it travels around, lands itself on this unit, the unit takes it inside, pulls the battery out, puts, puts a new battery in, and it's completely automated. Nobody's sitting there flying this thing around. The waypoints of flight are already known, and it does it on uh, a two-hour basis, an every three days basis, whatever you decide. And drones are not necessarily small. Consumer Electronics Show three years ago. Passenger drones. Cool. But robotics is more than just drones, right? Robotics are in agriculture and in a big way. And they have the ability to automate major processes. This is a uh, fully automated tractor with a fully automated system behind it that uses optics to, optics to identify weeds and debris in a row of growing plants and remove them. This thing can do the work. It also has lights on it so they can operate at night. This thing can do the work of six manual laborers at the same time. There's the lights, right? 24 hours a day, seven days a week if you want. Never gets tired. You guys know who this is? Seen this guy in the news yet? This is Baxter. He's an AI robot capable of learning by watching. Right? So if you do this, then he can do that. You can also directly manipulate his hands to like show his hands what you want his hands to do and then he can repeat that motion and you can teach him by actually moving him. Programming, like sitting down in front of a computer and uh, programming XYZ points, that doesn't have to happen anymore. You can teach robots by showing them. Here's robots. You guys know Foxconn? You've heard of Foxconn? It's a company in China that makes most of the stuff for Apple. Now, Foxconn laid out 60,000 Chinese workers to replace them with these, which is interesting because that means that robots are now cheaper than Chinese workers. What's that going to mean over here? Right? How many cars are being made in this picture? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And how many people? Maybe two? See that guy? I think there's one other guy over there behind the pillar. Eight cars being built, so that's two people, eight cars. Yeah, that makes sense. They pay for themselves in a single year and run virtually cost-free for 20 more years. That's a big deal. Yeah, they're not just doing basic labor, pulling weeds, welding joints. Da Vinci is a robot capable of performing surgery. 
same reaction from me. <laughs> but here's where it got interesting when I thought about this. If I have a surgeon walking towards me, the number one question that I have in my mind, how many times have you done this and how successful have you been? How many times have you done this and how successful have you been? Da Vinci performs thousands of surgeries per day. Hmm. Excuse me, where's the robot? Can you bring the robot? This is interesting. These guys are uh, autonomous house builders. They 3D print homes. Concrete homes that last longer than wooden homes. And they can do it in a day. These guys have spools of metal that they extrude and weld into a lattice structure to form a bridge. They start at either end, press go, and they meet in the middle. Let's talk about chatbots and artificial intelligence. This is a space I, I work in, chatbots and AI. Right? We know about Alexa, we know about Siri, we know about Google Assistant. What's this really going to mean? They are capable of simple things now. What's the weather, sports scores, movie times, play the music, start the movie, right? More things are coming. Current capabilities. We can order food, flowers, call a car, home automation, start the sprinklers. Very soon. And in my, in my business, I'll show you some amazing things that uh, artificial intelligence bots are capable of. Appointment setting, taxes and banking, financial management, complex and big data queries. These things are coming and they will be automated. It's important to recognize that it isn't just rote tasks that are subject to automation, complex tasks like surgery, strategic tasks like Go. All these things have potential to be automated. I used to go through an exercise, tell me any job you're interested in and I'll tell you why it might be automatable. It doesn't mean that there aren't gonna be any jobs. It means they're gonna be really different. And I can talk about that when we get towards the end. Companies investing in artificial intelligence. It's another huge pyramid, right? Lots of energy, lots of money. Here's the one, right? This is 2017, AlphaGo. So we were, we were the dominant intelligence on the planet until maybe last year. Was it fun while well, it lasted? Sure. <laughs> we also have developed artificial intelligences that are more accurate and more capable of identifying cancers than uh, the top uh, human doctors. Because they have the ability to look at hundreds of thousands of cases and remember every one of them. And apply that knowledge as they're looking at, at, at your imagery, your scans, and make determinations accordingly. Because imagine the best physician in the world, the best diagnostician in the world, could they hold on to a thousand use cases in their mind? That'd be impressive. Maybe a hundred. Maybe a hundred, but there is no limit to the number of use, uh, sorry, of, of prior medical history cases that an artificial intelligence can draw on to reach conclusions about your scan. Unlimited. This is an amazing idea, and it's real, and it's here, and it's now. This is, uh, there's gonna be some imagery here. What we're gonna, I'm gonna show you here in a second is an intuitive design AI. An intuitive design AI has the capability of exploring an entire solution space. What the heck does that mean? This AI has been asked to design a drone chassis. It has been told there's four rotors, there's gonna be a battery. Now I want you to tell me how to create a chassis that is strong and light, right, and efficient, aerodynamic, etc. This artificial intelligence will explore every possible design and test it in modeled space until it comes up with the optimal outcome. Every possible design that you can think of, it can think of faster and test until it gets you to the optimal. This is an Airbus design, obviously, it's not real yet, but intuitive design AIs and 3D printers are being used now to develop partitions on airplanes that are lighter and stronger than the ones that humans can design. As an example here in a second of uh, using intuitive design AI with a sensory system, put sensors on a high performing race car chassis have that race car be driven by a world-class driver around a world-class course, 
and record 100 million points of data and then ask an intuitive design AI to improve on the design of the chassis based on that information. So it'll be faster, so that it will be lighter and stronger. It would not be possible for a human to process every possible design. And what's amazing to me about the ultimate outcome of this is how it looks organic. And this can be 3D printed, whether, by, whether with plastic or with metal or whatever other material you can imagine. And the designs are beautiful, and they're efficient, and they cost less, or they're stronger, or they're lighter. You name the factors, make the request, start off an intuitive design AI, and get the result. Chatbots are becoming more powerful. I and mean, again, this is the space that I operate in. You've seen, you know people, or, or do any of you, or do you know people who do Photoshop? Okay. How about Final Cut um, for editing movies or other, other movie editing programs? CAD design? It takes a while to get good at these programs, right? It takes a while to build that skill. But what if you had a chat bot sitting on top of Photoshop? The same way you would call up a designer and say, hey, I've got this image of this nice sunset on a pier, uh, but it feels too cold. Uh, can you warm it up for me a little bit and then make, make the gazebo actually stand out a little bit more contrast? Can you do that for me? Sure, I'll, I'll get that back to you. Imagine saying that same request to a bot like Siri or Alexa and getting the result. Adobe, the group that makes Photoshop, wants everybody in the world to be able to use their software, but there's a learning curve, right? You have to, be able, you have to know how to take advantage of the power of a solution like this. But what if all you needed to know was how to ask for what you want? CAD design, computer-aided drafting. This is where, where people imagine things, render them in 3D, and then have molds made or 3D printed or whatever it is. This is not an easy program to use, but it's enormously powerful. This is how you take ideas. This is step one, have an idea. Step two, render it in 3D space. Step three, materialize that idea, either through manufacturing or 3D printing or through uh, machining or however you would do that. Imagine CAD design having a conversational UI, Alexa or Siri sitting on top of that. And then put that power in the hands of anybody who has a computer. Think of how quickly things will start to develop. Now you're starting to see the power of the exponential age, right? We're gonna give these capabilities, we talked about augmented reality and the ability to see everything that I needed to see in a complex system with knowledge that I don't even have. How do I fix a helicopter engine? Put the goggles on and have a look. How do I design something in CAD? Say what you want. This kind of power in the hands of hundreds of millions of people. And now imagine how much more quickly we're going to start moving. These are examples of things that you can ask the artificial intelligence that my company builds. These look like strange requests. These are requests that come from the people who manage the revenue cycle of enterprise scale healthcare systems, right? So you're thinking about companies like Kaiser and Sutter and Cleveland Clinic, right? Some of these larger organizations, they have hundreds of data analysts that exist inside their, uh, inside their systems. And these are the kind of questions they get. These are the kind of questions that you can now ask our AI, Anna, and she will give you the responses. Think of how much depth of, of subject matter expertise is required to, to educate a bot to be able to operate with something like this. It's substantial. But once you've done it, you've really got something powerful. Right? Oh, may I ask a question? Yeah, man. Th those requests, at some point, were something that humans yes. would research. Totally right. But now we have artificial intelligence that we could easily just ask them a question and it's like this. That's right. Instantaneous. That's right. Yeah. So I'm saving myself money uh -huh. in terms of what I'm paying you for wages. Right. I'm saving money in terms of health care benefits. Totally. Oh, absolutely you are. Yeah. And and is available 24/7. And it's available 24/7. That's right. Yeah. And and the response is much faster yeah. and all the same things we said about the about the guy driving the truck down, you know, uh, I-5 to, to Fresno or down to LA, right? right? Doesn't get tired? Yeah. Doesn't get grumpy, get angry, doesn't need vacation all the time, always on. Right. And that the, the right now companies across every industry are developing solutions like this. 
topics that I want you guys to explore, right? So we've sort of like hit the punchline here about the magnitude of impact that's coming and, and why it's an exponential age and what that really means. But these are topics for you guys to consider. Every one of these is actually a talk that I do, um, but we don't have time to do more than introduce you to the exponential age today. These are important things to look at. Why is human behavior in evolutionary psychology important? I believe that there's something that AIs will not be able to do in our lifetimes, and that's connect us to each other, or even connect us to ourselves. No matter what industry you're looking at, what career you're aiming towards, think about the human aspect of what you want to do and focus there. How do you tell your story? How do you, how does your industry, your solution, your invention, your career help people experience being human? AIs won't be able to do this for us. Only humans can do this for us. I truly believe that the Zuckerbergs, Elon Musks, and Bill Gates, and Steve Jobs of the next era will be the ones who find ways to connect us to ourselves and connect us to each other. Thinking about technology, we've kind of got there. It has been said that any technology significantly advanced, sufficiently advanced, will appear indistinguishable from magic. And we've been looking at some superpowers, right? I've actually literally been a professional magician for 20 years. I have seen the reactions of performing magic. I have seen the reactions of advanced technologies, and they are the same. We're at the magic moment for the development of technology, but we have not focused on the development of our humanity. I believe that time has come. Find your opportunity to connect people, and you will succeed. Thanks. All right, so I think in our society, we've always thought about this linear model of I go to school, I get some work, I get my degrees, and I, I get this specific position that's going to pay me a substantial amount of money. Yeah. But what I'm really hearing is technology is really going to shift mm. how we're looking at our education, how we're preparing ourselves for the future. Uh, based on the fact and the research that you've done, seeing how technology is influencing the job landscape, what do you think that's going to do for the masses that aren't preparing um, to work with or against this technology? Yeah. Um, and how do you think society is going to adapt to that? Because then that means that you're talking about thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of millions of people without jobs yep. that aren't going to have this education to be able to work with these computers or compete with this technology. What would you recommend for a generation that I'm assuming most of you are under the age of 21, 22, mm -hmm. to prepare for what's coming ahead. Because, I mean, me, myself, I, I'm from the old school, right, where we had that brick cell phone yeah. and, and the battery, and now technology is rapidly evolved in a matter of 10 years. And I imagine it's going to continue doing so in the next 10 years. It, it is, and this is, I love this question. There's two things I'll say to this question. One is there's going to be some bumps. There's going to be some bumps. The, the, the pace at which our access to that, that conversational UI so that a person who doesn't know how to work with computers can CAD design and then 3D print anything that comes out of their head, that's not going to happen at the exact same rate that I've lost my job as a trucker, right? Or lost my job as an accountant or lost my job as, a, uh, as a, uh, um, someone who does design on Photoshop. It won't happen at the exact same time. But I'm hoping that it's close. The second thing is... The way that this is going to impact the market of the job space really ties me back. I don't know if you guys have heard the, the quote from Jim Carrey when he talks about how his dad could have been a great comedian but didn't do that. He chose instead to take kind of a career job because he wanted to support the family, but he actually lost that job. Mm -hmm. He got let go. Um, and it was hard on the family. And he said, so the idea here is that you can fail at what you don't love. I would say finding what you really feel aligned with doing mm -hmm. and pouring yourself into it is really the answer, especially at, at the age that we're talking about in this room. Yeah, there are going to be some people who are 10 years, 20 years, 30 years into a career path that got into that bargain 
with the understanding, I'm going to be able to retire and then I'll be beyond this. Retirement's looking nearly mythical at this point. Um, you know, if you look at the, the, the average savings profile of a U.S. citizen and that they can, can hardly sustain like a single minor medical incident from a savings standpoint, that's a big deal. Just one, one more thought, which is, so if you're not going to be able to, quote, retire and move into an era where you're finally doing what you want, if that's becoming a myth, maybe start thinking about what lights you up now. Because the passion that comes out of you cannot come out of an AI. It can't happen. And when you're doing what you love, what happens is people recognize that passion in you. And an AI will never be that passionate. That's how I think you find the path. First question. Okay, so we're looking at this technology, and is it, is it going to be like kind of like a sweep type of thing, where it hits the more developed countries first, and then we're looking at the more poor areas. That's such a great question. It's so interesting the way that this is happening. Drone delivery networks. I mean, you think you're just standing around here waiting for you know the dominoes to start showing up with a drone, right? But that hasn't happened yet. There's experiments taking place in different pockets around the U.S. But at the same time, in third world countries, drone development networks are blown up. Why does that happen? That happens because the the transportation infrastructure didn't get developed there. But they still need medicine, right, delivered and shipped around the country. They still need other things that are critical to be distributed. But they don't have the roadways. So it makes perfect sense that they would leap to a drone delivery network over us because we have standard delivery mechanisms. We've got UPS trucks and USPS trucks running all over the place. So we don't have the urgency that that problem really meets with. So in some cases, the answer will be yes. We'll see the beginning here. In other cases, the answer will be no. It depends on where the technology meets with the need. It's going to be a really interesting time and super hard to predict, yeah. All right, so in terms of AI, so you see it how you're, you're speaking about it being um, exponential, mm -hmm. uh, the growth in it. What does that mean for college students? Why are we here? Especially if there's people going into nursing and being surgeons and doctors, people spending thousands of dollars to get an education which is going to be obsolete not too long from now. Yeah, talking? this is another really good question. Obsolete is not a word that I'm going to agree with because there's foundations in an education that will serve you through the rest of your life no matter what. But here's what's important. While you're here, be learning about what you're passionate about, not what you think is going to make you a ton of money or what other people are pushing you towards because there will not be a way to sustain something that you're not passionate about. Nursing will always be needed, at least during your lifetime it will always be needed, but there will likely be a decrease and the folks in that space who know how to successfully interact with the tools that are being developed in that space will be the ones who can persist and succeed there. Specific to nursing, what they call the silver tsunami, where the baby boom generation is, is now coming into retirement and then, and then moving into long-term care situations, that's actually going to put an increasing burden on, on physicians and nurses in the coming years. Will it last? I don't know. We'll also find that, um, that in-home care will, will start to increase because we'll have telemedicine that makes it possible to take readings like blood pressure, glucose, other things, so that you can uh, multiply the efficiency or the effectiveness of a singular general practice physician or surgeons, while nurses tend to go to the front line, which is going to be happening more in the home. That'll be an interesting shift as well. Are you studying nursing yourself? No, I'm not. No. Curious. Yeah. Well, I'm in a certain position right now that this may, this is extremely relevant for me in the situation where I know in the next five years, technology is going to be able to do what I do for you folks. Because you're going to be able to put what university you want to go to and it's going to completely outline every semester how it's best for you folks. So what I'm doing is I'm thinking ahead of the game. I'm already starting to think about how do I learn programming? How do I learn technology so then that way when technology comes and tries to take my position or the college starts to consolidate, I'm ahead of that learning curve by being able to say, oh yeah, I, I could actually program that or I know how to teach online because right now that's the biggest push is less classroom time, more online class. And you're going to see that as time progresses, especially with these universities, you're starting to get a lot of online universities. So that means less classroom time. Right? So we, you know, we, to answer your question, I feel like we need to adapt and be able to not only follow our passions, but kind of 
work with technology as it continues to evolve. Absolutely, yes. So that was you, yeah. Yeah. Um, so just so for pursuing our careers, we should keep this like how technology is advancing so quickly in mind. So do you think that maybe not change our majors, but shift them a little towards a, more of a human aspect? Because I know like I saw a documentary on how nursing uh, because it's all being like surgeries are being like um, with robots, but like that personal aspect with nursing or with uh, counselors, not mm -hmm. uh, therapists, isn't going to go away for a while. So should we like be uh, not shifting our careers towards a little more like that? Or should we just... I think if there's any, any one indicator or compass you can use to point yourself towards how to get the most out of this educational experience, it really is what are you passionate about. If you don't have an answer to that question, then exposing yourself to all the different areas where you could potentially develop a career is the next and most important thing for you to do. I, I recommend you go to conferences, right? So if there's like a hand, maybe three or four industries or sectors that seem attractive to you, go to the conferences. See the keynotes. You're gonna see the most recent developments, the cutting edge stuff that's going on. The leaders of those industries are gonna be speaking. They would literally love to talk to you. Truly you, they would love to talk to you because as a student who's, who's trying to really gauge their interest in that space, they will make time for you. Find them in their booths, uh, capture them after their keynotes and say, hey, look, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about this space. Tell me about your experience in this space. Take the time to do that. Even if you have to do it through email, I really encourage you now to, to, to look into the career directions that might interest you and find out. Because you can look back on four years, three years, two years, whatever is spent in this space and go, why did I do that? Mm -hmm. What is it that I have now in my hand with this diploma and how can I use it? Don't be there. Find out what you're passionate about because it's going to do two things. It's going to put you in a better position after you graduate, but it's also going to make it so that what you're studying, you really want to dive into, right? And to be aligned with, with your interests so that when you're out of class, you're back at home, you're still reading the magazines of that space, right? You're still watching the YouTube videos from that space. You're going to magnify, uh, duplicate, really, what you're going to get out of this educational experience if you focus on something that you're really driven for. Find out what that is. I really encourage you to find out what that is. It's a perfect time for you. Other questions? Yeah. Do you think we're going to get scared of this technology in a way? Because I was like reading in the news that Tesla, one of their auto drives, like somebody crashed and died, mm -hmm. and then their stuff started to go down. It's also an example of like air companies when they had airplanes, yep. and they just started crashing, and then eventually the like airplane just, the company just shut down. Like, yep. Will we have that, you think? I think, I think we will in a, in a way, yeah. There, there's, it's interesting, like if you propose a technology, imagine proposing a technology that allowed people to, to move around from city to city um, in a really efficient way, but probably 40,000 people a year would die. No way. They would never let you do it. There's one right there. I can see maybe 50 from here. Cars, right? It happened. It happened because it created a, a convenience, it created an efficiency, it met a need, people love the independence. If, if the technology appeals to people, they make it happen. Uh, yeah, I, I share your concern that there will be some challenges and some dangerous things can happen. Um, and as I said, I've got the question coming up from my own son, what do I feel safer about him driving himself or a car driving him? I, I haven't answered that question yet. And with all the rest of the technologies, artificial intelligence, et cetera, there are things to fear. Um, and, but people are going to use them because they're there. We can't stop these things from being developed. Yeah, in the back. Um, I was going to ask, do you think like, all these technologies are going to be available to everyone? Great question. Is that like, an even thicker boundary between like, the higher income? Such a great question. Um, Let me answer this. So I do believe that, uh, that cell phones, smartphones, phones as capable as these will become free. So the two things about this. One is we've got uh, Elon who's covering the world basically in a 4,000 satellite network that will give everybody access to the internet. Facebook doing the same thing, but they're doing it with balloons, which is weird. <laughs> it seems weird to me. Uh, but, but access to the internet becoming ubiquitous globally. Very cool. Why will these be free? If I cannot get data on you, if I cannot market to you, if I cannot sell to you, you are of no use to me. I need you to have one of these, but I'm not gonna convince you to have one of these 
by telling you, I want you to have one of these so that I can sell things to you. Yeah. Or so that I can get data on you. Mm -hmm. I'm going to convince you to have one of these because it's going to give you access to the collective intelligence of mankind. MIT, Harvard, and Yale all have their courses available online for free. So if you have somebody, uh, let's say, in a, in a poor area of India, who's been given a free phone because of the reasons that I just mentioned, they now have access to the same education as the billionaire's son or daughter. That's compelling. And then along with, along with that access that we have where I can look up on YouTube to see an appliance, how do I fix this car, how do I do that? Every one of these people will have access to that information. Imagine now how exponential our progress becomes. Put the power of the collective intelligence to mankind in the pockets of 2.5 billion more people and imagine what can happen. And then layer on top of that the chatbot capability for CAD design, for graphic design, for movie editing, for whatever you can imagine. Yeah, another question. Yeah. Um, do you ever think you're focusing on the wrong problems? Yes. We're wanting to get everybody internet, but like, will internet solve like worldwide hunger or like some people don't even have a home? Great. Will like technology help us get to there? This is exactly why. This is exactly why I, I call this the guys, guys, guys moment. Here's what I mean. Yeah. We have been developing technology to the point where it has become magic, but we haven't been developing our humanity. So it's like, guys, 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 look, we got there, we made it, our technology is magic now, and we can literally ask for what we want. We're there. Mm -hmm. right? I don't mean just put the tools down and walk away, but like, we really have come to the point where we can just say what we want. Now I believe it is an opportunity for us. And as people you know, get off, um, displaced through automation, I think that we're actually going to open up an opportunity for us to develop something besides our technology, to actually develop our humanity. Mm -hmm. And in that process, I think that the issues that you mentioned will be better addressed. So until then? Stay tight. <laughs> <laughs> it's happening now, right? And I do agree until then. But this is why I'm in front of you guys encouraging you to find out where your passions are and to focus on the humanity of the areas that you're interested in pursuing. Do you think it'll ever like come up with an uprising between the people who are like, yeah, technology, and then people who are like, no, technology. That's every day. Yeah. That's every day. Do you think it'll be like, a really like big violent? Issue? Yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. Like it'll be like a rural area where there's like no technology and then like futuristic world. I hope so. Can I get a ticket for the place that doesn't have it? I just want to be there sometimes. Yeah. I'd be interested about seeing that movie. You can remember it. I think I've captured the full time here, yeah? Fantastic, yeah. Uh, you know, one of the, there's so many things that stuck out, but you know, for real. Oh, all I want to say is, folks, remember this time and moment, 10, 15 years, as technology starts to shift, because this stuff right here, it, it is just, um, yeah, it's, I'm just kind of speechless in many ways, you know what I mean? So I think you did a fantastic job. I think you did a job. How will technology change your industry? Well, finding your passion yeah. within, I think this is the secret today, you know what I mean? I don't know, that's cool though. Thank you.